So this is the role that I provide for the organization. Oh, I was trying to get into Vent, but I couldn't get into it. I'm trying. Oh, that's me. I could join from my phone. Yeah, that's how I get through the day. That's how I, that's how I get through the day. Look, look. This is how I get through the day. But we're working it out. Uh, no, gracious people ordering at the last second. I have seen that. Don't in the day. Uh -huh.
thing about throwing them out. And it's like, no, 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 no. Let's go out to the park. Six of them seven on the table. I don't know. Any panel? I have them in the club somewhere. So they are up in the in my Don't go to So, they, they gave the shelter to us. It's very beautiful. And she probably folded it up and put it in the office. We can, I bought them two flags for Juneteenth. Gorgeous, gorgeous flag for Juneteenth. I've got, I bought, uh, for, I had a whole bunch of pictures of church activities and made into mixed tiles and frame. And there's a little box to Jesse. And now we've got this beautiful, beautiful quilt. But we have a bad habit of collecting stuff that we should have to dig it up. Fabulous. Good for her. <laughs> I love it. So, uh, my granddaughter. Uh, yes, I love it. Uh, 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 yeah. She, now that's, she, uh, she needs to send that to her college applications. Ooh, right. This is not a one off like those applications. Look at me doing martial arts. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so nice. Yeah, they can do it. Thank you. 
All the boys who came to run with her and to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me grab my let me grab my first. So, so is your car, is your truck big enough to carry on the wind size measures? Size 12, 12, 
Oh, you your car. No, you know what Okay, well, the twins have been at my house. So I need to get to see the light of my So there's a way for you to come to my house. There's a so when you the Everybody at a different level. We've got new youth telling today, as well as our youth who've been who are going to be graduating out. They have graduated, and once you graduate high school, then you move on to the next level, right? So this particular performance has from the newest, first time ever on stage mm -hmm. to the oldest, right? Okay. And uh, now look now, don't be saying, oh yes, kids. They, yeah. I'm telling you, be ready to be amazed <laughs> because our youth have been invited. Many of them have won a national awards at the National Association of Black Storytellers. They have been invited to perform at Illinois Storytelling because word got out of how good they are. So just relax and enjoy. And if there's some young people in the audience, you know we got room for more. <laughs> so I would like to introduce to you Brooks Lansana, who is going to start us off because I used like to do a group piece, but we have a leader here. Brooks Lansana. Brooks has been around. He's one of those, not, not the oldest, but he's been around for a while. Uh, he attends GCE Lab School. He's a member of Rebirth, Rebirth Poetry Ensemble, and he's won several awards for his writing and performance, including the Gwendolyn Brooks Youth Poetry Award and the Art Institute Obama Poetry Contest. He's also a recipient of the Baba Jamal Karam Youth Award for Storytelling, and he participates in the Aquaban Rites of Passage program, Free Street Theater, and Chicago State University Pre-Engineering program. Yeah. So, yes. We got the intellect and the artistry. That's right. Um, <laughs> We are Ashe stories for you. We are Ashe stories for you. We pride ourselves on delivering truth. We pride ourselves on delivering truth. We are Ashe stories for you. 
I will write a new page in Black Book Three. I will write a new page in our story. Back a little bit because I don't have a, a, my own cover for the night. But next, we have another of our newest tellers. His name is Bryce Hillary. He's eight years old. He loves spending time with family and rapping and doing karate. Now, this is his very first time telling with us. And so we are excited that you're going to hear this new voice that comes from a long line of storytelling voices. Bryce Hillary. <laughs> It's probably my first time, but what I would like to say is I'm thankful for my family. Yeah, great time. Thank you for my daddy and my mom for giving me the courage to be my first time. What I'll be doing today will be with a team Washington oh. and his black story. Booker T. Washington was born in 1856. Usually, a lot of people try to book their team, but maybe the mic. Maybe the mic. Here, maybe the mic. His life was hard because a lot of people called him Booker. So when his mom married um, a person named Washington, he took that name to become Booker T. Washington. When Booker T. Washington was five years old, he realized that his mother was praying that Abraham Lincoln would win the Civil War. He didn't understand what she was doing, but he did understand that Abraham Lincoln would win the war. When he was nine years old, a soldier came and told them that they were free, but they had to learn everything over again, including brushing their teeth. So when they were growing up, Booker T. Washington always wanted to go to school. But before that, his mom gave him a book called The Blueback Spiller by Noah Webster. But Booker T. Washington always wanted the book, so he took very great care of it. A person told him that do you want to go to school or come to Hampton Institute? So he went 500 miles mm. over there, mostly on his feet. Mm. And when he went there, he learned science, geometry, math, including history, which we're talking about right now. Mm. So the people invited him to another school, which he conducted his own school, but there was nothing except a few shots and a chicken coop and 30 students. So the 30 students in him built the school with 40 buildings and they invented the desk. So they learned more and more, just like Hampton Institute. And then Booker T. Washington invited one of our other Black people, George Washington Carver. We're not going to get into his story right now because it's all about Booker T. <laughs> Booker T. Washington invited him, and he said, yes, I will go to Tuskegee Institute, and he became a teacher there. After that, there's a few problems because the black and the white had problems of agreeing on each other. So he started to let them make a trade because they also had to make money for the school. So he started making speeches and traders and interviewed them. When he went to New York, he collapsed. He had a serious injury. So the people took him to the hospital. When his wife came, he said these words. I was born in the South, I labored in the South, and I will die in the South. 
So when they took him home, five hours later he died, and that's why they put him right by Tuskegee Institute. We all honor Booker T. Washington because he had to raise money for the school and did great things for our honor. We all honor Booker T. Washington because of these great things he did. Thank you. <laughs> Just so you know, today is a fundraiser. It's called Storytelling for a Cause because we support the National Association of Black Storytellers. We also, I'll let Edie tell you about it a little later, we're supporting a, a, an orphanage in Africa and the food pen right here in Chicago because we tell stories to lift people up, but sometimes they need a different kind of lift, right? So I hope before you leave, if you haven't already donated, you'll think about donating. Our next storyteller, though, like we, we started with our youngest, right? But our next storyteller is a seasoned storyteller who is going to be leaving us this year because. He's 18 years old and he graduated from Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences. Last year, last year he did receive the Baba Jamal Quran Youth Storytelling Award. And this year he received the gold medal in the statewide Special Olympics competition. He loves to paint and create art. And he has been an active member of our shade for many years. He has autism, autism, and he's gifted with communicating in his own way. So I want you to welcome Ari Lanzana. <laughs> hey, Ari. Okay, here goes nothing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Art, and I'm going to tell you a story about Dr. Lonnie Johnson. Dr. Lonnie Johnson was an inventor, an engineer, and a scientist. A scientist who loves to play with science. He, he made making a machine to go across the room. So he wanted to get the toy. So he invented the super soaker. A super soaker can shoot water really far away. Talk about making them splash. <laughs> We thank you, Dr. Lonnie Johnson. That was a Rider Tactic Machine. And you like getting wet? I do. You like water? I do. Ew. 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 Thanks. I'll be back a little later, but now we are going to hear from his brother, Brooks Lanzan. I told you all about Brooks at the beginning because he started our chant to bring our youth in. I'm going to just change your mic cover while you're coming up.
All right, so I'm going to tell you all a story about a friend of mine. I met a little bit while back, but before I get to that, I got to tell you that this story was an adaptation from a different story that I learned a couple of weeks ago, but I decided to try to turn my own twist. All right, so I'm going to so I wanna talk to you all about a friend of mine named Chris. Now you see, Chris, he's kind of gets tired sometimes every now and then, but for the most part, he's a really hard worker. He's a very kind person and someone that personally I enjoy having. Now you see, Chris, Chris lives in a town that is kind of separated into two sides. You have the east side, which is where most of the wealthier population is, and that's where they kind of live. They do their own kind of stuff. And then you have the west side. And the West Side is just the lower income community, but also home to many of the hard workers. So you see Chris, Chris, he lived on the West Side. And one thing I can tell you I can never trust Chris with is setting for a test. Let me tell you. So there was this one time I was trying to go to his house to help him study for a science test that he had. And we studied for five minutes, and then we ended up just playing video games for the entire time. So it just it was, wasn't great. He, I mean, I guess with that, he just, you could say he procrastinates a lot, which is something that not only he's working on, but I'm working on. Yes, <laughs> just all of them. All of them. So it got so bad to the point where his mom had to tell him that if he didn't pass his next test, he'd be put out of his house for a kind of pretty long time. So when it came to him, when he decided to try to start studying, he tried to study, you know, but of course, went on to do something else. And then eventually when he went on to go take the test, he did, he sadly ended up failing and he got put out for some time. But on the other side of the city, while this was kind of happening, we we're going to talk about someone else. This person's name is Wealthy Man. Now you see Wealthy Man, Wealthy Man, I mean, of course it's in his name. He has a pretty nice apartment. He also has a lot of a couple other things just around. He also has a daughter. But one thing that he that people always ask about is his son. You see, his son that he always talks about, saying that he's so athletic, he can never make it to certain community gatherings for some strange reason. But the thing is, he only really has a daughter. He doesn't have a son in the first place. So when he's well. When both of them are just walking about in between the little like halfway point between the east side and the west side, they did end up meeting. And Wolfie Man asked Chris, Would you be my son for a little bit? And would you like to come live at my house? Now, Chris thinks about this decision for a little bit. He's thinking, Well, I don't have a house at the moment. I'm also just on the street for a while because I can't really pass tests, but maybe, maybe this opportunity could lead to me maybe getting better studying habits or maybe just having more opportunities or some just those types of things. That's kind of what he was, he told me. So when she decides to take this opportunity and he goes to live with the wealth, with wealthy men and his daughter. So he goes in and he did, he does end up trying to study he ended up also getting a couple other things because he ended up passing like, a couple of his tests. So he just has a lot of stuff. And he, like, sort of art piece, you could think he has it. Then he sort of like clothing line, he has it. Any, any sneakers, jacket, something, whatever, he had it. Yes, because he was working hard and learning how to at least build good habits. He also ended up actually blanking the dog. The wealthy man's daughter, so they ended up dating for some time. I don't really know the gist of it. I just know that they're just not enough. I don't, I don't even know. But eventually, Chris's mom finds out about the situation and gets a couple of her friends on her side of the side of the city and goes straight to wealthy man's house. Now, wealthy man at least at one point he hears a knock on the door. Now, you see, and goes to the door. And then Chris's mom, you see Chris's mom, and Chris's mom just say, give me back my son. I want my son back. Give him back. He was gone for way too long. I can put him out for just a little bit. Now he's gone, and I don't even know where he is. So Wolfie Man invites Chris's mom in along with her friends. And next thing you know, they were just arguing and talking back and arguing and arguing and arguing. And then eventually Chris walks in from his bedroom and tells him this all to stop because he didn't understand why. He, he truly didn't, at least in this point, he just 
truly was just confused. Now, wealthy man told Christopher the fact that I can't, he, I let you live with me, but then Chris is now I'm on the other side of what it was just thinking. I just stay out for them too long. I wasn't gonna have you on the streets forever. What do you, what do you, who do you think I am? You're not your mother. So it came down to a point where wise man told Chris, or his wealthy man told Chris, that he had to make the decision to either live with his mom or live with him. So Chris, he took a second to make this decision. He thought about it for a while. It took him actually a couple of days. And he decided to decide, he decided to live on both sides. So on for one week, he lived on one side of the city, and the next week he was on the other side of the city. Now you see, with Chris going back and forth between sides of the city, that actually led to both like sides actually trying to go and talk to the other side, trying to get to learn them what they like to do, set the types of things that they're into. And Eventually, they ended up actually making peace with each other, so there was no really hate between one another or any side of the line. So, the lesson of this story is, it doesn't matter where you are or where you came from or who you know, we can all learn something from each other, but most importantly, study for your tests. Thank you. <laughs>
Now, the lesson of the story is too many cooks for the cook. And since our theme is what Black means to us, or Black is more than a color, to me, Black means unity. And unity is communication and working together. So when her sisters worked together to help her, they made a wonderful present for her mother, and they all had a good time. Thank you. Yay. I'll, I'll, I'll bring you back up. But first, we want to call Ari back up. Ari, come on up. <laughs> We always like, you know, when our youth move on from high school, they they can no longer be part of our youth. Be just because it, I know their life is there, they're headed toward adulthood. And but we like to give them something to remember us by. I know we are we have given cow tops, which is which is our favorite, but you know. You ever tried to buy anything that's imported lately? Mm -hmm. Can't do it. So what we did was we went to uh, everywhere. That's a African bookstore on the west side, and I think that, and we would like to eat together. <laughs> Will you wear it? Yeah. You want to show? Yeah. And I'm going to ask the, the other Hashem to come up. storytelling we like people to our youth to be proud of their culture so we thought we'd give red black green to commemorate today and i and this particular concert is called black is more than a color it is not just the color and so we asked our youth well if black is more than a color what is black so Ari, you want to start us off? What is black? Black is tiger tasty. <laughs> black is a never ending movement. Black is unity and working together. <laughs> Black is strength. Black is the essence of which all color comes. They came up with their own definition of black. So this just lets you know that we have thinking young people that we're leaving the world in good hands. Yes, it. That's right. You should know because we could not do this. We could not do this without the parents. So, um, Rice, you want to call your mama? Oh. Rice has more than just the mother right. and other relatives here. Grandma. 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 <laughs> 
had with Jim and Mom. Today is Jim and Mom. And we got our mom. Okay. And a couple of people in the back. Okay. <laughs> I want you to uh, to wish them well, to know that uh, our, our world is in great hands because we have these brilliant children coming up. And I'm going to ask you guys to, to head on out and I'm going to ask Mama Edie to come up and talk a little bit about the orphanage that we're Good afternoon, everyone. And we can say Akwaba, which is uh, welcome in Ghana. And I want to give thanks for Ashe agreeing to allow for some of this fundraiser to go to an orphanage in Ghana and its related school that I met the uh, where I met the director in 2015 when some of the storytellers from the national organization went to Ghana to participate in Panifest. And the reason why it's particularly urgent that we raise money for them now, you know, this is the rainy season over there. And due to very, very severe winds and rain, the school that we had was totally collapsed. It was a six classroom structure that was made of wood and tin roofing and that kind of thing but it was totally, totally flattened. Um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we had a situation where the roof was taken off of the home, of the children's home. We got that fixed, it's a lot stronger, but now the school is really very much in disarray. Uh, the water and the electricity was turned off. We finally just got the water and the electricity on back on last week. And um, so anything that you could do, just go into your heart, and if you could offer a little something to help to help to support um, my kids in Ghana, and I want to give a special thank you to uh, Sister Gwen Hillary because we were together on that first trip over there. She saw how much I wanted to go there, and I connected with them. And she come and came and hung out with me. On story. That's right. That's right. That's right. We told stories there. And uh, the children loved it. They kept following after Gwen. They were fascinated with how, how lovely and tall and elegant she was and what have you. So it was a wonderful thing. And I'm grateful to Ashe. And Gwen also took a wonderful photograph that we are using uh, as well. I'll be doing a, a GoFundMe page for them uh, soon also. But uh, And one of our storytellers, uh, Oyale, got a chance to go. She's over there now. Got a chance to visit with them. And another friend uh, was able to take over some la a few laptops and a couple of telephones and what have you. So uh, I want to thank Ashe for being a support in the past um, because one of our previous storytelling for cause concerts, which was several years ago, Ashe also agreed to support Sankofa Preparatory School and Sankofa Mbofrapie, the children's orphanage. So I'm really, really grateful that they decided once again to support my babies in Ghana. So thank you very much. You know, I will take my break. So uh, you can celebrate it online that time. But we also have an often place um, right here. So that if you have a text or if you want to give or if you walk or any time, you can go to that person. Uh, if you did not go online, uh, go on the registration and make sure you make sure. Thank you so much for that, Gwen. And the last thing, I've got a website that I just managed to create and will be going public pretty soon. It's mamaedie.com. And within the next few days or so, um, we should have the situation. There's a donate button on there 
that takes you directly to the school and the orphanage. And so if you click the donate button, it will go directly to them. So uh, thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take a very short break, I want to introduce our vice president of Ashe, Dr. Elijah Paul. <laughs> Uh, it's been this has been a pleasure, you all. Um, so much so. Can we give our, our young people another round of applause? Um, I just want to let everyone know that uh, this brings us joy. You know, it's this is black passing. Okay, <laughs> blackity black, blackity black. Um, and I love it, and and we are here not just to raise money. We are here to educate. We are here to preserve culture. We are here to preserve history. We're here to preserve a storytelling tradition. And so when you see young people get up like that, a six-year-old, we all just get as young as Never told a story before. And guess what? He set the tone for the adults. Okay. Okay, so to you all, everyone that makes your contribution work wonderful. So just real quick uh, about the business, we have raised four hundred and fifty dollars up until now. So thank you everyone. All of your donations online. Uh, if you if you have uh, are, are watching from Zoom, we've got about twenty plus people on Zoom right now, and you have not donated, please donate. Uh, you can go to our website to donate. If you are in the house and you would like to know if you're going to go around uh, collecting a donation, we can also make the check out to Ashe uh, as well. And, um, you know, we will be accepting donations through uh, the end. We're going to take a five, six minute break and then we will be back. We have some more first time storytellers coming up in our adult portion of the show. So you do not want to miss uh, the next half.
like to do for you. Because now, the adults are about to make their entrance. Right? Okay. just said and we know that our words have power don't we don't we because we know that with our words we can either lift each other up or we can tear each other down we don't have time for that last one right so the Asha you have been here to lift us up to educate us and to inspire us like brother Dr. Elisha Paul was saying and our adults are getting ready to set you on by now talking about how just how much Black is more than a color. <laughs> I don't want, I want to, before we start telling, uh, is Brother Elijah? Yeah. Well, in that case, So what we're going to do before we actually start telling you is something we do at every concert. We pour libation because we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. I always like to let you know that chances are if you don't have an ancestor, you're not here. <laughs> Okay, Ashe. Mama Edie is going to pour a libation. I'm going to ask you to say Ashe with us. Even though our ancestors were brought unwillingly during the time of the transatlantic slave trade, and even though we were cut off from our mother tongues, our natural languages, and forced to speak the languages of the colonizers, two kinds of words, of the invaders, to the point of punishment. And even though we were forced to start, stop practicing our own religions and many aspects and dimensions of those natural cultures that had come through African people, we still brought a lot of Africa with us. And we stand on the shoulders of all those ancestors, of those ancestors who taught us so much and who were the first teachers, the first healers, the first preachers, the first mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, lovers, and friends. To those ancestors who established for us how to live and how to love. 
and who taught us that we are the people who know how to make a way out of nowhere. We ask him for a libation. Please respond with our shed. And we would be remiss in not thanking the creator who gave us the gift of those ancestors. That creator who has made everything, who has given us the gifts of life and breath and family and friends and the power of our words so that we would know how to connect with each other and how to lift, lift each other up and how to heal each other when we need it the most. To this creator who teaches us constantly through all of our trials that that presence, that omniscient presence is always with us. We just have to believe it, have faith in it and hold on and continue to do our best. And that creator will always continue to bless and guide us. We just have to pay attention. Ashe? To the ancestors who came across during the time of the Middle Passage, who endured more trials and tribulations, far more than many of us can imagine. To those ancestors who jumped off of slave ships because they preferred that their babies coming into the world not be born in this new circumstance that they couldn't even quite understand they had found themselves in. To those ancestors who continued to stay, who struggled through all those circumstances, who supported each other, who through their genius and their intelligence were able to communicate across their languages anywhere, who were determined enough to practice their own spirituality that they taught the, that they took the spiritualities being forced upon them by their conquerors and they found a way, a way called Santeria for those in places like Puerto Rico and Cuba, the way of the saints. So they were able to hold on to that spirituality so that even though a spirituality was forced upon them, they were able to find strength within it and they were able to maintain some of their African essence that help them to hold on to these ancestors we ask them for a libation. To ancestors that were spoken of today, such as Morgan, uh, Garrett Morgan, who created the first traffic light and the gas mask and so many other things. And to the brother who did the, uh, who invented the splash toy. <laughs> Lonnie Johnson, <laughs> and to all of our other inventors of gadgets and things and equipment that help to make life easier, and to people like Dr. Danny Hill Williams, who developed Provident Hospital right here on 51st Street because Black folk kept dying on the way to try to get to medical care being refused for that service. And who also, who also performed the first successful open heart surgery to people such as these and to all of the artists, to people like James Baldwin and so many other storytellers call out the names of some of the people whose shoulders we are standing on. Lorraine Hansbury. Lorraine Hansbury. Angelou. Okay. <laughs> To all of these activists and artists and musicians and literary giants who continue to burn that spirit that Spirit that lives within us keeps it alive. We ask them for that nation. And now please call upon the names of your personal ancestors, your big mamas and Uncle Bobo and whoever else is in Speak those names out loud. Let them know they're not the bad. And to all those and to 
all those whose names still lie resting on our hearts, whose names have not been spoken. Please say it like And last but not least, to all those yet unborn, to those spirits lying in wait, we ask for their guidance from the other side that we continue to do what we do in such a way that once they get here, that they can pick up from where we left off and that maybe life won't be for them quite so hard and they'll be able to continue to forge a way to lift life up, not only for our people, but for the world. We ask them for our nation. It is done. Thank you. Thank you, Mama Edie. We always we stand on their shoulders and forever will. And hopefully somebody's going to be standing on our shoulders. And that's why we tell stories to make it a better day. Now, this first teller is new to Hashem. Not necessarily new to storytelling. When her storytelling was originally in writing, she's been an educator in the Chicago public school system for over two decades. Betty has mentored and motivated many, and next came her challenge from students to come out of my, her comfort zone and write a rap. And by the end of the class period, that rap resulted in what became a book. Growing Pains, Real Talk Poetry for Young Adults. She loves sharing what she has learned to be true and awakening those who are, who are ready to hear it. Because we're not always ready when we hear it. But you know, if we keep saying it enough, you'll be ready. But seriously, if she feels the vibe, she's got to let it flow. <laughs> so now she's got this new challenge to continue what she loves to do in a slightly different form, taking it off the page and letting it come through her mouth, storytelling. So far, it's taking her on a very enlightening journey and to think she has only just begun is exciting. And we are excited to hear her first public telling right here with Ashe. And the name of her story, the name of her story is A Trip to Gabon by Yaya Sonko. Greetings. My name is Jean, and I would like to introduce myself and share my story with you. 10 years ago, I went to Gabon, which is on the West Coast of Central Africa. The people there embraced me and felt that I was one of them. I felt entirely at ease. On occasion, they would volunteer as community workers and I would gladly join them because I never felt as an outsider. Sometimes I blame God for not providing me with such a group. They live in such an engaged society, yet they take it for granted. They almost always greet each other. They appreciate all lives, both inside and outside of their community. There was a celebration one day in the distant village and all of the community members, except the children, attended to celebrate this honor. They asked me to join them, but I was exhausted and preferred to stay at home. Eventually they left. Not long after, a fire in my neighbor's house. Fire, fire, fire. 
Vaya. 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 Everything in the house was burned to ash. As the fire was expanding, because of the culture of one community, I quickly ran over to my neighbor's house to see if I could be of assistance. Unfortunately, they were among those who had attended the affair. However, they did leave a cat and dog in the house, which I quickly grabbed and took to safety. I was concerned that they would be sad when they returned. Sometime after midnight, I could hear joyous voices approaching the village from afar. I knew it was them. I felt terribly sad at this point. I, I was a little jealous by the growing loud voices of enthusiasm. I had never seen them upset or sad during the entire time that I stayed with them, I had often wondered what they look like when they're sad. I told myself, maybe now I'll have the experience of seeing how they appear when they are happy. When they arrived and heard the news, they immediately inquired about the safety of their pets. To which I responded that I have taken them and kept them safe. I said this with a little dismay because I was sad that I couldn't stop the fire. But all of a sudden, they chat in unison. John the hero. I believe their culture encourages them to celebrate one another. I am astonished that no one is distressed any longer. I also know this that they care more for people and animals than for destruction of property. Those whose homes had burned were distributed among the community members to spend the night with. Utilization, drumming, Dancing woke me up the next morning. Everyone gathered around the destroyed house to begin the process of reconstruction. Some days later, I left to go home. As I boarded for my trip home, I mentioned this tale to an African passenger on the aircraft. He said that that is the core culture, core African culture. It is called Ubuntu in some parts of Southern Africa. It is the culture of inclusion. Gertrude Mache, creator of Her Story Circle, in defining Ubuntu, said, we rise by lifting others. Ubuntu is a cry or a call to those who are struggling to stand on the shoulders of those who have risen. 
to give back, to give a hand up, not a hand out, to stand with, not walk by. She also set the principles of Ubuntu include empathy, compassion, connection, and collaboration. She concluded that if Africa is the cradle of humanity, then every human being on the planet is of African people. And the principles of empathy, compassion, and collaboration are the superpowers of every human being. Moral lesson, let us live as a community, embracing and caring for one another, because that's all we have, it's one another. Let us live as a community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's lift each other up. That's why we tell a lot of things. Now you've heard one of our newest tellers, but now we're gonna bring up a young man who has been with us some time. He exited our youth group last year, and we said we gotta have him back because we couldn't do anything for him last year because. We didn't even meet in person last year. This young man is a sophomore at the University of Chicago now, where he plans on studying political science. And this summer, he served as an intern at the Chicago Community Trust, where he's worked with data that helped to fund Black and Latinx businesses. Owen looks forward to starting his school here this year, and we look forward to hearing him right now. Owen Child. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Thanks. I'm glad to be sharing my story with you guys today. Yeah, but as Mama Kucha mentioned, uh, I'm currently at the University of Is it okay if I can just push you? Oh, okay, you just feel Um, I'm currently a sophomore, second year student at the University of Chicago, and I'm studying political science. And the story that I'm going to be sharing with you guys today is actually the story that I wrote for my entrance as a music college. It's called The Art of Skateboarding. So I find it hard to beat the feeling of skateboarding down Michigan Avenue on a warm summer night while popping alleys and weaving in between tourists. Just like the city streets, which haven't been repaved in years, Chicago's skateboard scene is notorious for its rough and gritty skaters. Whether grinding the ledges at the Aeon Center or skating the stairs at Chase Plaza, I'm always meeting new people steeped in a culture that seemingly targets aimless youth. Now, some have argued that skateboarding is more of an art form as opposed to a sport, in the same way that you know ballet and you know dance are considered art. The more time you spend on your art, logically, the more comfortable you become as an artist and the greater your ability to express yourself through your art. So with this thinking, there are some skaters that prefer to do their tricks as fast as they can, and others, they prefer to you know, slow it down, making their tricks look smooth 
and graceful. It all depends on the person. A lot of the time, it depends on your story. On that first day of COVID-19 restrictions, I grabbed my skateboard and I decided to go out for a cruise downtown. I mean, other than the sound of my wheels, the air, it was completely empty. I mean, being downtown, I didn't recognize it. There were no honking cars. There were no impatient taxis. taxis. I mean, it, it was completely foreign to me. There were no tourists on the street. And the restaurants, some of them had signs that said closed until further notice. During my hours of skating, I only saw three people. One was a photographer. He was, you know, taking pictures of the surreal moment. And the other two, there were less fortunate individuals who I thought about for several days afterwards, worried about how the virus might impact them. In the time that followed, I stayed inside, but like so many others, I longed to be out again. I mean, every day I remember thinking, will our way of life ever return? For me, skateboarding just provided me a relief and it offered me, more importantly, a routine, right? Being in high school, it was school, homework, skate, repeat. School, homework, skate, repeat. I mean, I did this every day and it kept me grounded as my mom, she was traveling to take care of my aunt who was battling a very cool illness. Now, some months later, an unarmed black man was murdered in Minneapolis. And it seemed, it seemed like the world finally had woken up. I remember being on State Street. I heard cars honking and parading. I grabbed my skateboard and my mask and I went out once more. For as far as I could see, there was a whole line of cars, people of all different ages, and ages and genders, I mean, and races, that they, they were all sprouting outside of windows and they were holding up signs that said, justice for George. I followed the cars in the direction that they were going and I ended up at the Daily Plaza. I mean, when I was there, I was like, I know this spot. It's a famous skate spot in Chicago. And it's also the same spot that I was at the summer before my fifth grade at another protest with my cousin. I remember I was holding up a sign that said, I am Trayvon Martin. I skated home that day, feeling as though voices were unified and as though a reckoning had arrived with similar protests taking place all across the nation. But like history has shown, some of these deep rooted challenges, they just tend to repeat themselves. As time went on, others looted businesses and destroyed property. I skated around the city in the day that I followed. Shattered glass was all over the sidewalk. Later, statues toppled and came down. A statue of Christopher Columbus, but it actually stood at least 200 yards away from uh, a popular skate spot called Grant Skate Park, that came down. Now me personally, I like to do my skateboard tricks, you know, boldly and with decisive movement. For me, you know, skateboarding has become so much more than a pastime. In fact, it's become a tool that I've used to gain a better understanding of the world around me. Today, I'm focused and passionate about working with others who are different and diverse, but united in courage to change the world. And I take the lessons that I've learned from skateboarding into this next chapter of my life. Thank you guys for listening to my story. I appreciate it. Who the fuck is skateboarding? Carry such significance, right? Got him into the University of Chicago, all right? So, but, but we like to think that another thing that helped him get into the University of Chicago was being around storytellers. <laughs> Our next talent is someone who likes to use the telling name of the minute. Patricia Serenity Red. 
is the silky smooth, tranquil teller of tales. She has captivated audiences with the tranquility of her voice and believes that stories are gifts wrapped in the spirit of breath. And you know, you got to have breath to live. I'm just saying. <laughs> so Patricia Red is telling us a story called The Enchanted Box by Susan O'Halloran, but with a serenity twist. <laughs> Thank you, Kita. Before I start, I'm ashamed. I'm not going to have to worry with the essence of Owen Charles. Thank you. Thank you so much. I also want to say that Black is more than a story. Black is more than a color. It's unconditional love. And you'll see why. There were three couples, each of whom had been married for 12 years, and each whose relationship had grown sour. Not because they fought, but more because they hardly communicated with each other. Bit by bit, piece by piece, the small hurts and resentments grew year after year after year until a wall had finally been built between those couples. Now, the first couple, they were servants. They worked in the big house. And one day, when they were fixing up the sitting room, a teeny tiny fairy was flitting all about their heads. Now they didn't know what in the world that fairy was doing or saying, but the voice was audible enough where they understood every word she said. I challenge you to go to the castle beyond and then you will find a great hall and in the great hall will be an enchanted box if you are able to figure out the secret of the enchanted box you will have untold riches day after day after day but if by the seventh day you haven't been able to figure out that secret, you will be turned into stone. And that fairy, well, she disappeared as fast as she had appeared. Now that couple, they side-eyed each other. And they said, I guess this is something we could do together. If it's going to make us rich. And they had the nerve to think that maybe with the money that they were going to get, it would help them have a better marriage. And so they quit their job and they went off to try to find this castle. This castle was not easy to find. I mean, it took them days. To find it. They went through valleys, they climbed over hedges, they went over ditches, and finally they spotted the castle at the edge of the wood. Now to get to that castle, they had to take this one particular road. And when they went down this road, at the end of it, 
in an old beggar woman that was tattered and torn. She raised her arms up. I'm and I have one wonderful thing. That husband, in his sarcastic way, said, we're trying to get to that castle up there. And if they don't have any food, what do you think we're going to do? We don't have anything for you. And Martha went. And when they turned around to see if the old beggar woman was still there, she was gone. And that husband, he said, hmm, for somebody that was crippled, she sure moves fast. And he and his wife, they laughed their food head off, something that they hadn't done together in a very long time, even though it was at the expense of that old baby woman. Well, when they got to the castle, the grass in front of the castle was eight feet tall. Okay, it wasn't eight feet tall, but it was tall. They weaved through that grass and they made it up to the door. They rang the doorbell and no one answered. They knocked on the door, but no one answered. So they let themselves in. And when they got in, they saw that the castle was empty. But not only was it empty of people, it was empty of furniture, except for the Great Hall. The Great Hall had a fireplace that was lit. That had a table that stretched from here to all the way back there. And on the table, sat a mahogany box that more than likely was the enchanted box. That husband and wife, they almost knocked each other down trying to get to that box. And when they lifted the, tried to lift the lid, nothing happened. The husband banged on the lid, but it didn't open. The wife took the box and she shook it but it didn't open. And that husband said, woman, that guy told us that if we didn't figure out the secret within seven days, we were gonna be turned into stone. So think. <coughs> now, how would you like if somebody talked to you like that? <laughs> they danced on the box. They told jokes to the box. They sang to the box. Nothing happened. This went on for seven days. And on the seventh day, they knew. Well, I'm not going to say that. They would say <laughs> At any rate, both of them had the thought in mind that they would sneak out of different doors and leave the other behind so that uh, whatever was going to happen would befall the one that was left. And so when it got dark, each one of them snuck out of different doors. But as soon as they hit the garden, what happened? They turned into the That's right. Now the second couple, they were farmers. They heard the same message from that fairy. They ran into the same old woman. They got to the castle and saw that that grass was eight feet tall. Wait a minute, it was eight feet tall, but it was tall. They rang the doorbell and nobody answered. They banged on the door and nobody answered. When they got inside, they did the same thing that that first couple did. And at the end of seven days, what happened to this? They turned into stone. Now the third couple, they heard that same message, but they took some time to think about it. They didn't want to just quit their job. But then after talking about it, they decided 
this is something that we could do together. And so they did. They ran into that same old beggar woman. But different than the other two couples, they shared their food with her. And the husband, he even gave her his walking stick. He said, you need it more than I do. That old beggar woman snatched that walking stick out of his hand without even so much as a thank you and hobbled off down the road. But instead of disappearing, she turned to the couple and she said, light the candle, count your blessings to 10. Give your heart away to get it back again. And then she hobbled off right down the road. But when that couple got to the castle, the grants were eight. Okay, it wasn't eight that time. We got to the door. They rang the doorbell. No one answered. They banged on the door. No one answered. So they let themselves in. And when they got inside, they saw that the castle was empty, but not only of people, but furniture too, except for the great hall. It had the fireplace that was lit and the table that went from here to there. And on it, unlike the other couples, they marveled at how beautiful the mahogany box looked. And they took each other by the hand and they walked gingerly up to that table and they lifted the lid and it opened. Inside the box was one white candle and a pin cushion shaped like a heart. But before disappointment could set in, they remembered what the old woman had said. Light the candle, count your blessings to 10. Give your heart away to get it back again. And so the wife, she took the candle and she lit it. The husband took the heart as he held it to his own. And he looked at his wife and he said, you know, honey, I got a lot of things that I could talk about why our marriage has been blessed. I'm, I'm just sorry that I hadn't really thought about it in a while. So he named five things of why he thought his wife was a blessing to him. And when he had finished, the wife then took the heart and she held it to her own. And she named five reasons why her husband was a blessing to her. Now, I know you want to know what those five things are. I'm not going to tell you all that, but I'm telling you one thing he said and one thing she said. He said, honey, I just want to thank you because you put my medicines together in those little boxes every week without fail. I love you for that. And the wife, she said, well, I mean, I just want to thank you for the time that I couldn't bend over and paint my toes anymore, and you did it for me. I love you for that. That night, they had the best sleep they had in a very long time. This went on for six days where they were doing that. But at the end of the seventh day, when they thought they hadn't figured out the secret of the enchanted box, that old woman appeared and she said, I just came to say thank you for sharing your food with me and for giving me the walking stick. And the couple said, oh no, it should be us that thanking you because you told us what we should do when we got here. And you know, we've had time to think about why we fell in love in the first place. Sure, there have been things that happened. Sure, we have argued. But you helped us to reflect on 
all the little happenings that we do that are good for one another and all the kind things that we should say to one another. That's my dearie, is the secret of the enchanted box. And with that, the old woman turned into that teeny tiny fairy that was spinning all about. And with a wave of her hand, this way and that, the lid opened. And out of it came all kinds of gold, silver, rubies, you name it. A box is overflowing. And that couple, they lived in that castle for the rest of their lives. They had one more request, though, of their fairy. They said, you know those statues that are standing out in front of the, the castle there? Would you please turn them back? Because their look of terror no longer fits the atmosphere of this castle. And she did. <clears throat> that night, with the fireplace lit and the ambience of the light, that husband and wife, they held each other close and they danced to Darling, you send me, darling, you send me, darling, you. Send me, one as you do, one as you do, one as you do. Say some nice things to one another. <laughs> And it's, it's something we have to remember because, you know, I have to say this, because in this audience today, there's a couple that Bob, Tony, and I always say we want the world to be just like them, and that's Fred and Flora Lott, right? That Christian. <laughs> Anyway, um, our next storyteller is Baba Tony. To Baba Tony, storytelling is sacred. Whenever a story is told, we need to be focused on listening and giving our total attention to learning. He believes stories can transform and inspire his listeners. He is also a djembe spirit drummer and plays banjo shaped gray bones and mbira. He has an amazing ability to create an environment for learning, growth, and development while being entertaining and creating a lot of fun for his participants. He is traveling, storyteller, performing across America and beyond. Storytelling is powerful for all and Right now, he's going to tell you a story called Freedom Time. I always like to start with the djembe. I don't know if you know this, but before we had email and texting, our first communicator was the African drum. That's how we talk to one another through the djembe. Every day, the boys would wake. They would wash up, they would eat, and then they would meet. Always greeted each other with two head shakes and a good boy. To leave, to leave, look what I found last night. Shows him this pew of rock had green, brown spots on it and beautiful designs 
Talib looked and said, oh, that is so beautiful. Then they went back to the river to get more rocks and seashells. Malik says to Talib, to Talib, Talib, you are my best friend. And Talib said, ah, you're my best friend too. Then they went back, got some more rocks, more seashells. Then Talib looks at Malik and says, you know, I am hungry. I think we should get a couple of birds. And so Malik agreed. And they set up a wonderful little trap. And within the hour, they caught a bird that they could clean, cook, and eat. After they ate, they started reflecting on what the elders told them about sailors. They told them about all the adventures that sailors go on and all the different things that they discover. You know, elders can tell you a story. Then, to leave, remember the day they went to the big river and they had buffaloes and lions and hippopotamus and birds. And they looked at how the big hippos came out that water and how the lions just waited patiently. But they soon found out there were no match for those hippos. So it's always good when you're watching hippos and lions to watch from a safe distance. And they did that. When Malik took in all the surroundings, the beautiful land, all those beautiful mountains that seemed to go on for miles and miles. He looked at that big river and he saw the brown and clear water mixing together. He just said, oh, Africa, wonderful. So they went to their hiding place, they pulled out their drums and they started one day and two and one and two and a Oh, they had a ball. They drummed for hours. They were doing solos and they were doing together all kind of rhythms. Oh, they just loved that. Then they went back home. The next morning, they would wait, they would clean up, they would eat, and they met. And they met this time near the shore. This particular day was a little bit different. It seemed like the water was just moving a little too fast. Talib was the first to see. He looked way down yonder and he saw these ships coming in shore. Malik saw too that the little boats were bringing men into the shoreline. And these men were up to no good. They spoke a strange language and they had weapons. But Talib says, Malik, go to your home. Tell your, your parents, the villagers, what's going on? And Talib, he followed. Well, Malik was the first to get there, but he was too late. They had gathered every able man and woman and all the children. They had lined them up. They had them in shackles. And they were going to take them to the small boats and then to the ships. Well, Malik looked up and one of the strange men saw him. He tried to run as fast as he could, but he got caught too. All he could think about was his friend Talib. Was he safe? Did he get caught? Well, when they came down to the shore, Malik saw Talib. Little did he know that he would a long time before he see his good friend again. The journey started along the ocean and the sharks were falling close behind. All the captives were inside the belly of the ship and conditions were horrible. The smells, the sickness, ah, oh, this young man just couldn't take it in. Well, they started going and going and going. And all of a sudden, 
one of the captives, the male captives, he got sick. Do you know they took him and threw him overboard? And some of the women, they were having babies that were in that way. If they couldn't hold their own, they too got thrown overboard. Well, I could tell you in our culture, we were taught to respect and honor our women. That was our culture. I just couldn't understand why they would do that. But you see, this is a long, long trip. Many, many, many months had passed. Many years had passed. I can recall thinking about how can we escape? And we mostly did that in our minds because there was no escape. So time went on. I grew older, and I just knew that my friend Tali was okay. All I could do is wish him well. Well, finally, we hit what they call the free world, the land of opportunity. When we got there, a lot of us were put in the chopping block. Those that weren't in the chopping block went to the big house. At night, they would put us in these little houses called slave quarters. They selected me to be in the big house. I was to be clean and trained to be a servant to the owners, their friends, and their business associates. And we were trained that you had to stop on a dime if they looked at you a certain way. You had to be quiet. But I was happy because I could get three meals a day and sweets. And as long as I was careful, I was okay. So the trip went on. Many in the big house became very excellent at being servers. And for me, this new position was wonderful. I was eating, ready to eat. But one day, they sent us out and they ask us, since you're now the foreman, you go and get food for the whole house. And I was happy. I went, and as I was walking to the merchandise general store, I got this warm feeling inside. <laughs> Warm feeling made a sound, right? I got this warm feeling. As I turned, I saw this really tall man. He looked at me and says, Believe it's Tali. I was like, wow. And he shook his head twice and he pulled out one ear. I would turn to jest. My best friend, we hadn't seen each other in 20 years. We came together carefully. We greeted each other and started talking about the 20 years that had passed by. It seemed that Tali was in the next town over. He had worked his way to be a foreman. And he was in charge of all the scenes, all the equipment. My best friend was bad. But you know, we had to be careful because we were still in bondage. We were still enslaved. But we talked about getting together as much as we could. And we did. These young boys were now grown men. And they were back together. And look, to have your best friend back in your life, you're on a road to freedom. Freedom bound, freedom bound, freedom bound. <laughs> We talk about enslavement. We can do the ugly side, or we can do the nice side. The 
there's a lot of ugliness and still many are enslaved in many ways know that you are free and some of us have been free so long we forgot that we are free don't forget that add to the world you know that you are fantastic with inside and out please love each other help each other and i just want to say to my favorite elders thank you for coming laura Well, now we have a really great treat for you because our next teller, Wendy Hillers, is going to tell us about wild vibe. She's going to set us on fire. You know, Wendy is a former president of our state. She has been on the board of the National Association of Black Storytellers. She brought her grandson into our youth group. <laughs> and she is not letting anything or anyone hold her down when she. No, 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 I'm a right. I had to walk in here with this thing I'm just trying to use it. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Oh, God. I had said uh, three years ago that I would uh, never tell another story again. Um, uh, after my sister died, I lost my spirit. And I said, I'm just going to enjoy storytelling because I just don't have it in me uh, anymore. But you know, something happened that made me decide I had to tell this story today. I was at the post office buying those stamps. And all of a sudden, I looked in my hand, and there was a picture of Mary Edmonia Lewis. I said, how in the world did Mary Edmonia Lewis get on the stamp? She's the 45th African-American to be commemorated by the post office on our stamp. And I bet most of you here don't know who she is. Is that right? right. Oh, that's right. So I said, I'm going to get myself up. I'm going to refresh the story that I told about her 20 years ago, that suddenly she's back here in my life. And so I'm going to tell you the story today of Mary Edmonia Lewis, also known as Wow. <laughs> I want you to say some words for me. Say magnificent, magnificent. unstoppable, creative. What about you? Those are attributes that describe Mary. Mary and Monia Lewis, and I'm going to call it Monia. That's the name she referred was born in 1844 in upstate New York. She is so unusual. Her mother was Chippewa Indian, and her father was a free Haitian who had come to work as a gentleman servant. And they lived among the tribe up in that area, selling trinkets and moccasins and doing whatever. And so Mary, I was going to call it Monia. So at Monia, had the life of being a Native American. And so her whole life was foraging for berries and selling and being free. At the age of five, she was orphaned. I don't know how both parents died at the same time, but she became an orphan. But as with the African community, the Native American community took her in and her brother Samuel and they raised her until she was almost 12 years old. Now, this brother Samuel went to California, got with the gold rush and got rich. Oh, baby, he was rich, rich enough to send 
but his little sister. And he even had barber shops, he had businesses, and he sent for her. And he had her educated. There was an order of uh, African American nuns who started the process. Then she went to a prep school. Her grades were good, but she was expelled because they said she was too wild. <laughs> now, if you've been free, how did you suddenly get confined the way all this was? She had great grades, but she was out there out of school. Her brother Samuel said, no, no. Now, Overland College had begun to take students of all races, all colors, co-ed, and Mary got admitted to the prep school there. Now, she had a focus on art. She was using her hands to draw and think and be creative. And so at Overland, she started that curriculum. Uh, uh, uh. Black is more than a color. While she was at Oakland, two of her classmates accused her of trying to poison them. Mary or Edmonia, of course, I don't believe really did it, but we never know what goes on. But all I know is that she went to trial. She was exonerated, but a mob of vigilantes accosted her one night when she was walking home. And they beat her, beat her unmercifully, and left her for dead in a nearby field. She recovered, went back to Overland College. Shortly after that, she was accused of stealing art materials. Anything to stop her from achieving her goal, she never did graduate. Now, her brother Samuel said, no, 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 we're going to still do some things. Now, at this time, I have a poster to show you that I'd like for Tony to hold it up on, on the altar. At this time, this was during the time of the Civil War on the other end of the soldier. This was the time of the Civil War. And at this time, there were many soldiers fighting. Well, the 54th all black regiment went off to war in Boston, Massachusetts. And she saw these wonderful soldiers going into war. She was so inspired by the leader, Colonel Goodshaw, Shaw, that she, upon his death, and upon the death of 42% of these valiant young men, she sculpted a bust of him. And family liked it. And so they purchased it, and that began her career of making money. She made busts of uh, John Brown. She was a true believer in the support of the abolitionists. And so, with the money that she made from those first and small medallions, she left and she went to London and she set up her studio there. Her studio became the must for every American traveling abroad. Her commissions were as much as 500, no, 50,000, give her 500. She made commissions as much as $50,000. They say uh, Frederick Douglass went to visit her. They think mm -hmm. that she, one of our presidents set for her. But the main thing is that she was making big money, came to Chicago, but, one day, she had a dream, a dream to make something so magnificent that the world had never seen. Now, in her studio, she had the design, fashion, and chiseled that marble with her little hands, because she knew the world would not believe that those hands had made these magnificent products. One more time, so. So she created a 3,000 pound statue called the death of Cleopatra. What a mind, what a mind she had. The death of Cleopatra. I have a small picture so that you can see Cleopatra's face. 
as she entered the last moments of her life. Now, when critics saw this, some thought it was just magnificent, and others thought that it was just too, too graphic as the snake is still on her lap. It has just bitten her, and her head is thrown back with her choice of her way to die rather than to succumb to the Romans. This 3,000 pound statue was brought to the Philadelphia exhibition and it drew rays, but no one purchased it. At that time, it wasn't considered a wise investment to invest in black art. So it was not sold. Black is more than a color. Somehow it got into struggle and it was displayed here. Well, we're talking about almost two centuries ago and it was displayed here and it didn't sell. Finally, it ended up in a saloon. It ended up on the racetrack that's out in the forest park on the grave of a horse. The owner had a horse named Cleopatra and so he felt so busy that it should sit there. That sat there for almost 100 years. But then the post office and other facilities took over that space and it got moved to a storage place. And there it sat until the Boy Scouts decided to come in and try to paint it. And so it was so, so damaged. Where there was a, a curator, Emma Richardson, who started following Mary Monet Lewis, wrote her biography, and she heard that the statue was beautiful. And so she came and with the help of others, a GoFundMe raised over $30,000 to begin the restoration. It now proudly sits at the Smithsonian Museum of Art. All of Mary's pieces are being gathered now. And they are, they are at various museums all throughout the country, but so many of them are lost. She said, some people praise me because I'm a colored girl. I'd rather you not praise me. I'd rather you criticize me, but then I can learn something and do better. This country had no room for a person like me. I was driven to Rome in order to practice my art and not be seen so much for my color. Mary Edmonia Lewis was one of them. And she did something that the world has never seen, the first woman of color or African American to become a prominent sculptor and the first woman of mixed heritage, Native American and African American, to show the world that a woman only 40 could not be stopped by a white dominated society of men who tried to shut her out, but she wouldn't shut out. Unstoppable, magnificent, wonderful, Mary Edmonia Lewis. Thank you. Wow. Now you can look her up and look at her, see all of her pieces, learn more, right on them. Look her up. See who gets those stats right now. Oh, I'm so bad at stats. I hope somebody learned something today. I hope somebody feels something today. I hope we reminded you of somebody you know, somebody who you say, I've got to make sure other people remember this person because they have brought us this far. Now I want to um, call uh, Owen back up here for a minute. 
Because like I said to you, when Owen graduated, we were we were in the midst of COVID. We weren't in each other's presence. And um and I sent you a check that came back a couple times. And so um they wanted to make sure that you got it. <laughs> I want to say that here in this room we have several past presidents of our shape. And and I want um them to all the Ashe members to kind of start standing up. Did you want to say anything about this? Yeah, of course. Of course. You want to say yeah. Um, I'm really glad I got to come here and tell my story today. And I'm so thankful to still be involved in the Ashe community. Just the impact that uh, Mom Tony and Mom Prashad had, it's just been immense in helping me to become a more confident speaker and just feeling comfortable getting up and speaking in front of people. I mean, I'm just forever thankful and grateful to have these two people in my life and to have this great community here. And I'm just so glad to continue seeing you guys like when I can. I'm so thankful uh, to be doing this storytelling for a cause in person, uh, you know, because of COVID. Uh, it's so great to just be gathering here in this positive space. It's great energy all around. Yes. And this real quick, we uh we give all of our storytellers another round. <laughs> um, we were able to raise seven hundred and sixty thousand. Um, 300 of that was in an hour, okay? So that is, to me, the definition of a mutu. And I want us all to say this before we leave out here right now. Repeat after me. I am. Because we are. We are. I am. Because we are. One time, I am. Because we are. That is Ubuntu. We did it today. We thank you all so much. Thank you to Mama Kucha and Baba Tony, all of those who helped put this content together. Uh, we could not have done it without you. And uh, please join us as we do our annual storytelling concert coming up in a couple of months. Uh, it is going to be an exciting affair. Uh, you all think you saw, I mean, look at all this gorgeous African God right here. Okay, it's just gorgeousness, beautifulness. We love it. So please come back and join us again. Thank you all again. Thank you. You want to hear
each other up and we create a better day for the future. so so much important right now because we are our ancestors wildest dream we are our ancestors wildest dream part of that ancestral is embedded in us because we know we are connected we are connected we could not be here not for you and you and our ancestors stories i live in a house um, where my grandfather, my grandmother, and my great grandmother were. Mm -hmm. So one day she was having, we had the grandma sick because you know, her baby was having cataract surgery. My grandmother's baby. Mm -hmm. So she said, well, I know, baby, I know you don't eat no pork, but you're going out there and uh, I put some hamburger out on the table. You're going out there and uh, I find them scallions. Now she's got a whole garden. <laughs> I'll talk on the plane. I got out there and the back out of some gold. She told me what a scallion. <laughs> I, feel, I pulled up something that looked like grass, but it was a little taller. So I got it. Oh, I mean, oh baby. You know, it was always baby. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, baby, look at you. I knew you knew us. And I still thank Jesus. I still thank Jesus. For instilling in me the love for my people, be it by name, by color, or you know we you know we cousins. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know they always say we're six steps away from the other person. No, I've been I've been see down there in the Meridian, some of your people. I'm gonna see you down there. So we're only one or two, but I want to thank you so much for contributing. I want to thank you so much for coming. And put on your people today. Visit our website so you know our next concert because it's going to be what? Black ain't nothing but a color, but it's more than a color. <laughs> Asante, son. I just want to thank all of the RCA because we all work together. We all work together. So I'm just proud to just be called president because all everybody's president today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we appreciate everyone in our shape. We appreciate all those of you who follow our shape. And we appreciate all the ancestors. You know, we just love telling stories. And when, when I hear a child singing the song we sang or telling somebody else's story we told, it warms my heart. Because stories, sometimes that story will keep you from sinking down in the bad time. You know, I get sentimental, so I won't stop talking. <laughs> Have a wonderful week. 